the government place more of our resources in service of women's recovery efforts. The government paid special attention to women entrepreneurs in 2022, formulating the Women's Empowerment Program in partnership with the government of Taiwan and producing and providing grant financing to scores of women. That program continues in 2023. Similarly, the Honorable Prime Minister's massive expansion of the tuition scholarship program this year was explicitly pitched to the cabinet as a pro-woman initiative, given the existing dominance of women students in universities. Close to 70% of the 2022 tuition scholarship recipients were women, meaning that an additional 650 women will be receiving government support for higher education this year. We are also emphasizing the gender components of our ongoing TVET and life skills programs nationwide to ensure that those most affected receive the most support during our recovery. As part of the previously mentioned COVID-19 response program, Budget 2023 will provide farm skills training to 500 unemployed women. The Women in Agriculture program will work with an additional 50 women, and the Women in Leadership Initiative target is targeting a 30-member cohort. In 2023, we will continue our close collaboration and consultation with women and seek the perspectives of women from all walks of life in shaping our ongoing recovery. 2023 is not a year for returning to the status quo, but for embracing fresh initiatives and fresh hope as, we, as eagerly as we embrace the future. In that spirit, we must embrace the strength and ingenuity of Vincentian women in guiding us on our shared journey on the road from recovery to resilience. Madam Speaker, twenty twenty two was a difficult year on our shared battle against crime and criminality. Two years ago, in an address to the nation at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the Honorable Prime Minister presciently identified security, along with health, economic, and social concerns, as one of four intersecting dimensions of the pandemic that must be addressed. The Prime Minister warned, and I'm quoting the Honorable Prime Minister, that, quote, social and economic dislocation invariably presents opportunities for certain persons with a selfish or lawless disposition, a small minority, to disrupt or undermine the peaceful enjoyment of the lives, living, and prosperity, and prop, yeah, property of the vast majority of our people, unquote. Subsequently, as the natural disaster of April 2021 compounded the social and economic dislocations of the pandemic, the Prime Minister repeated these warnings and directed that more resources be allocated to policing and security initiatives. Yet, despite the hard work of rank and file police officers and some notable intelligence successes, we are locked in a heated battle with criminality. The causes of crimes are complex and responses must be carefully calibrated. Political or opportunistic grandstanding on this issue or infantile diagnoses are unhelpful. A focused, all-of-society approach is vital. Budget 2023 invests heavily in more boots on the ground to fight crime. We have created an additional 68 posts for police recruits and constables, bringing staff positions in the police force up to 1,121. Staffing of the police force has more than doubled since this government was elected to office in 2001. In that regard, remember that immigration was once staffed by the police, but today our 70 professional immigration officers staff a separate department and our police are allowed to focus on their core duties. Similarly, police services allocated $41.3 million in 2023 
a 7.4% increase over last year's allocation and a whopping 40% more than just a decade ago. In short, our challenges with crime fighting are not due to resource constraints. Numerous studies suggest that after achieving a level of adequate staffing, adding more officers is less impactful than other interventions like problem-oriented policing, neighborhood watches, hotspot policing, improved community relations, and focused deterrence strategies. In 2023, our emphasis is on optimizing these tactical interventions, better use of evidence gathering tools and networks, and improving linkages with other vital pillars in society's fight against criminality, communities, families, the church, and other social actors. The first responsibility of a state is the safety and security of its citizens. Citizen security is a fundamental prerequisite for inclusive and sustainable development. While there is no magic bullet to stop criminality, there is no substitute for hard and smart work and tactical innovation. Budget 2023 ensures that our police services are, have adequate resources to perform their duties. The government will hold the leadership of the police accountable for effective and decisive utilization of these resources. Last month, police intelligence led to the largest single seizure of illegal firearms in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That seizure took place at the customs, a vulnerable point in any country's security apparatus. Budget 2023 strengthens our capacity to thwart similar illegal activity, as well as speed the flow of legitimate ex imports with a $2.1 million investment in additional high-tech scanners and enhanced capacity to detect contraband. Similarly, phase two of the popular Taiwan-funded CCTV program will enhance the investigative and deterrence tools available to the police. As we have put more boots on the ground, we will also continue to embrace the use of cutting-edge technologies as a crime-fighting and prevention tool. The Honorable Prime Minister, who is also Minister of National Security, will no doubt address this issue more comprehensively um, in the course of his presentation. Moving, Madam Speaker, to the Grenadines. I wish I could. Over the last two years, the islands of the Grenadines have been blessed to be further away from the devastating effects of the La Soufre eruptions while being disproportionately impacted by the pandemic-related slowdown in tourism. Yachting tourism, the lifeblood of the Grenadines, cratered precipitously. Yacht arrivals in Bekwe plummeted by 95% between 2019 and 2021, while in Union Island, the fall off was 83%. Of course, most countries in the midst of full lockdowns had no activity whatsoever. In remaining open, a valuable trickle of visitors still came to the Grenadines. There are signs that the recovery, that the recovery is underway. In August 2022, the last month for which complete data was available at the time of uh, preparing for this speech, yacht arrivals for Bekwe and Union Island were at 80% and 70% of their 2019 high water marks. Far below peak levels, but definitely trending in the right direction. Anecdotal evidence suggests that the fourth quarter ended strong, particularly the all-important Christmas season. Budget 2023 initiates a number of important tourism-related projects in the Grenadines to facilitate a rebound in visitor arrivals. Airports receive, airports receive particular attention, with $5.9 million allocated to airport equipment and infrastructure in Bekwe, Kanawan, and Union Island. Another area of focus is education infrastructure in the Grenadines. The Kanawan Secondary School will receive additional classrooms, a food preparation lab, a construction lab, a staff room, and TVET equipment. Over 75 computers will be purchased 
for ICT labs at the Bekwe Seventh-day Adventist, Bekwe Community High, and Union Island Secondary Schools. Temporary classrooms will be completed to house students of the Mary Hutchinson Primary School and construction contract, and a construction contract for the rebuilt facility will be completed later this year. The Bekwe Community High School will complete a comprehensive multi-million dollar upgrade. The Myra Primary School will be refurbished, as will the Bekwe District Library. An important project, in the first, the, and the first of its kind in the OECS, will be the pilot program to create an advanced structure for the establishment of an inclusive school system in Bekwe, in partnership with the Sunshine School. This initiative is part of the World Bank-funded Human Development Service Delivery Project, and will seek to mainstream the educational opportunities of students with disabilities or other challenges. The Human Development Service Delivery Project will also enhance curricula and remedial education programs in Union Island and Bekwe. Budget 2023 also allocates $300,000 to expand the Port Elizabeth Hospital, $342,000 to upgrade market revenue and district council offices in Bekwe, Kanawan, and Union Island, and $696,000 to realign the road at Bluff in Bekwe. Other sections of the Paget Farm Road will be addressed in separate infrastructural projects this year as well. This year, Budget 2023 provides for a significantly upgraded hard court in Union Island, police substation in Myro, and the previously mentioned engineering evaluations at Salt Whistle Bay. A great deal of our recovery depends on the Grenadines returning to top form as a well-oiled machine, a well-oiled engine of economic growth. Similarly, the fragility and vulnerability of the islands demands special attention. Budget 2023 demonstrates the government's continuing commitment to both nurture and sustainably leverage the Grenadines' unique potential. Jobs. Three years ago, talk of a clear harbor call center in St. Vincent and the Grenadines was derided by some as an empty political promise. Today, the company employs over 850 young Vincentians and is in the midst of an expansion that will al allow it to hire 350 more. Clare Harbor has gone from zero workers to being the second largest private sector employer in the entire country. It is projected to surpass the Mustique Company this year. Three years ago, the government's announcement that Sandals would hire 200 Vincentians to work overseas was traduced as a falsehood. Today, Sandals has employed more than 300 of a promised 500 workers for overseas placement. And thus far, more than 200 local construction workers are employed on its hotel site at Bookament. Indeed, two days from today, on, on Wednesday, another 42 young Vincentians leave Argyle International Airport on a Sandals chartered flight to take up employment opportunities at regional resorts. Three years ago, ill-informed radio blowhards publicly questioned the business plan of Rainforest Seafoods and predicted its immediate demise. Today, it consistently employs over 100 processors and purchases product for more than 150 local fishers. Within the last 12 months, cruise ships have recruited actively across the country and employed or re-employed hundreds of Vincentians. There are more jobs in construction, more jobs at restaurants and lounges, more jobs in fisheries and agriculture, and more jobs within the central government than there were last year. The construction sector in particular is rapidly absorbing locally available skilled labor, and many contractors on schools, roads, hotels, and other buildings are reporting scarcity in certain skill sets, with wages rising as a result. Post-pandemic, jobs are returning 
to the Vincentian economy. It is useful to monitor the national insurance services data regarding active employees as a useful proxy for job market trends in the formal economy. While the total number of active employees fell by 1,711 workers in 2001, it has returned and slightly surpassed its pre-pandemic highs. The NIS data show that Solid recoveries are underway in accommodation, construction, and public administration categories. The information category is up by 169% over 2019 levels, reflecting the entry of Clear Harbor into the marketplace. Of course, NIS data does not accurately reflect trends in the informal sector or among self-employed and owner count workers because few of these workers make NIS contributions. Similarly, low NIS participation by agricultural workers, domestic workers, and other categories make generalizations in those fields uh, more complicated. Nonetheless, the 4% rebound among NIS employees between 2021 and 2022 makes it reasonable to infer that our economic rebound is not a jobless recovery, but instead one that is, again, generating employment for Vincentians. Madam Speaker, Budget 2023 increases salaries for all public sector workers. In September, the government on its own initiative Invited, labor invited the labor movement to engage in discussions about the potential parameters of a fiscally responsible package of enhancements to workers' compensation. We are a labor government. We did not wait to be prodded, cajoled, or harangued into wage negotiations. As promised, as soon as the data suggested that an economic recovery was underway, we reached out to the unions. We negotiated openly and in good faith, explaining our projections and constraints, including the limits of, fiscal, of our fiscal responsibility framework. We also began preliminary discussions on specific structural challenges of our current pension system. The unions, too, advocated strongly on behalf of their membership within the realm of what was achievable, tangible, and fair. The resulting package of wage enhancements is generous, yet fiscally responsible. Between 2023 and 2025 inclusive, we will implement a 7% increase in salaries and wages as follows. 2.5% increase this year, 2% in fiscal year 2024, and 2.5% in fiscal year 2025. Over the course of those three years, the wage increases will cost the government an extra $26 million, not including the usual salary increments that are available to most public sector workers. This year, Budget 2023 increases the allocation for wages and personal emoluments by more than $16.7 million, $16 million over last year's budget, a number mainly reflecting the impact of the wage enhancements and incremental advances within salary bands. This 5.7% growth in, the budget, in budget 2023 for wages and salaries is an extraordinary increase in light of the global challenges and fragility of our ongoing economic recovery. But our compact with the working people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is an unshakable one. It is those same workers who are the engine of our post-pandemic, post-volcano rebound. The Honorable Sabota Caesar, our Minister of Labor, has completed the process of selecting the membership of the 2023 Wages Council. 
That Wages Council will reevaluate and set minimum wages this year for many different categories of worker. Minister Caesar has committed to ensuring that the Ministry of Labor will facilitate the Wages Council equitable and expeditious decision-making process. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, the government has long been committed to providing internships and training opportunities to young people who need a little on-the-job experience to make them more attractive candidates for permanent employment. Our vener venerable Youth Empowerment Service, the YES, and Support for Education and Training, the SET programs, currently offer valuable experience and exposure to more than 700 young people annually. Budget 2023 enhances and expands this important policy initiative. First, in one of his first acts as a minister with responsibility for post-secondary education and training, the Honorable Prime Minister has mandated an increase in the stipend that YES volunteers receive during their internship. As such, the budget of the Youth Development Department within the Ministry of Youth has been increased by $1.1 million. This will translate into a modest but welcome increase of $150 per month to each YES volunteer. Monthly stipends will now range from $600 to $1,000 for YES trainees and mobilizers. That's per month. Second, Budget 2023 introduces an exciting new initiative called On Site, which stands for Offering National Support for Internship Training and Employment. In contrast with YES and SET programs, which largely place interns within the public service and selected state-related entities, on-site will exclusively place interns in positions within the private sector. The provision of real-world private sector experience and the real possibility of full-time employment is an important addition to our suite of internship opportunities. On-site will begin early this year with a six-month, $1.4 million pilot program funded by, the Taiwan, by a Taiwanese grant. We anticipate that roughly 200 interns will get on-site experiences. Some of these interns will have particular thresholds of academic accomplishment, while others will have specific interests or aptitude as demanded by the employer. The program will place young people on-site at major companies and small businesses nationwide. Depending on their interests and goals, on-site interns may find themselves in front of a computer, under a car to be repaired, or on top of a grain silo. In both white collar and blue collar fields, the objective will be to place interns somewhere that offers them real experience and a real possibility of permanent employment. Over the last few months, we have been consulting with representatives of the private sector entities and our own existing experts in the SET and YES programs to craft a program that meets the needs of all involved, while allowing us to collect sufficient data to make the program work going forward. We are excited about adding on-site to our YES and SET programs. We encourage all interested young people to keep their eyes open for the launch of the applications window, which should take place sometime in February. Budget 2023 is a jobs budget. Yep, yep. This government is determined to leverage our post-volcano economic growth to maximize job creation and opportunity generation nationwide. We are optimistic about the potential to continue building the employment gains that are already underway. I'm speaking a very important discourse. I'll turn to a very important discourse about the National Insurance Service and Pension Reform. Amidst 
the numerous challenges of 2022, the NIS played a pivotal role in contributing to economic and social stability under its social protection programs. The NIS has led, has held true to its mandate and provided some degree of financial security for our nation's retirees and workers. For instance, the workers who face social problems and risks associated with sickness, employment injury, old age and death received existential security through their NIS programs. Moreover, social security continued to ameliorate these new pensioners whose pensions fell below the minimum pension levels. To this end, the NIS program provided income to support 21,000 Vincentians in 2022 by paying $84.5 million in social security benefits, representing an increase of $2.3 million from the previous year. The crux of the income protection is outlined as follows. 7,133 contributory old age pensioners receive $66.7 million. Within this group, the NIS assisted 1,323 persons by topping up their actual pensions to the minimum pension level. 906 retirees receive $1.5 million under the National Provenant Fund program. 396 non-contributory old age pensioners receive $700,000. This category of pensioners has been receiving support from the NIS since 1997. 207 contributory pensioners received invalidity pensions in the sum of $1.2 million. 1,627 beneficiaries received survivor's benefits in the sum of $6.6 .6 million. This is the principal, principal death protection feature of the Social Security program. 10,501 insured persons receive $2.9 million in sickness benefits. 461 women receive maternity benefits in the amount of $1.5 million. And 241 insured receive $300,000 under the Employment Injury Benefit Branch. In addition to directly boosting the demands side of the economy. The NIS stimulated social and economic development through its sizable investments in the local economy. As of December 2022, the NIS invested $267 million in the economy to support economic development. The investment spread across the central government which amassed $51 million or 5%, sorry, 11% of the total investment portfolio. Statutory corporations and state-owned entities, $23 million or 5% of the total portfolio. And local financial institutions, including commercial banks, credit unions, $103 million or 22% of the investment portfolio. These investments comprise various financial instruments, such as bonds, $43.7 million, equities, $30 million, loans, $41 million, money market investments, money, money market instruments, sorry, $92 million, and real estate, $63 million. The comprehensive benefit program was principally supported by contribution income a levy on, insurance, on insurable wages of workers in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The NIS mobilized contribution in income of $73.4 million in 2022, compared to $68.3 million in 2021. The augmented contributions were driven by both public and private sector employees. And of course, the previously discussed recovery in, in that area. For the public sector, 
Government contributions marginally increased from $26.5 million to $26.8 million, and the contribution for statutory co corporations grew from $9.1 million to $9.5 million. In the case of the private sector employers, the contribution moved from $31.1 million to $35.5 million. The improvement in contribution and arrears collection reflected a growth in the active insured population from 41,521 to 43,307. Additionally, average annual insurable wages increased from $24,400 to $25,092. Lastly, the active employer's population, uh, employer's population, grew by 3%, moving from 2,064 to 2,135. I indicated earlier, however, Madam Speaker, that while it increased from la two years ago to last year, it still has not reached its 2019 levels. Um, investment income and a small proportion of the reserves supplemented the contribution income to meet social security benefits and administrative expenses. In the review period, the investment portfolio generated $15 million in finance income to fund recurrent expenditure. Also, approximately $6.2 million were drawn down from reserves to support the recurrent and social security expenses. The situation reflects the maturing nature of the social protection system and the need for further parametric reform. The asset base at the NIS fell sharply from $500 million to $476 million, largely due to the volatility and uncertainty of market factors, including interest rates and equity prices. These market factors had debilitating impact on the valuation of the NIS's international bond and equity portfolio. As at December 2022, the international segment of the investment portfolio stood at $107.4 million, or 23% of the total portfolio. This sub-portfolio, which generated strong double-digit performance in 2020 and 2021, suffered losses of approximately $18.1 million as a result of downturns in both stock and bond markets internationally. Institutional investors, including the NIS, witnessed the worst bear market in stocks since 2008. The stock market ended, the, this is the stock market, when I say the stock market, I mean the United States stock market, Wall Street. The stock market ended a three-year winning streak in 2022. All three major stock market indices registered their biggest one-year percentage declines since the 2008 financial crisis, with the S&P 500 posting a 19.4% fall in 2022, NASDAQ finishing down 33%, and the Dow Jones losing 8.7% of its value for the year. Bonds fared even worse than stocks in 2022. Inflation, massive rate hikes, and a super strong US dollar left bonds unattractive to investors. The 30-year US Treasury bond yield, for example, sunk to its worst return in a century. As part of prudent risk management and strategy, NIS diversified its investments across local, regional, and international financial markets. At the end of the fiscal period, the NIS's exposure to local, regional, and international economies stood at $267 million um, for local, 58%, $89 million for regional, 19%, and $107 million, or 23%, respectively. With regard to the international investments, the NIS experience realized losses of nine $9.9 million and unrealized losses of $8.2 million. However, these losses were cushioned by the investments in local and regional financial securities, uh, 
including fixed deposits, loans, and government bonds, which fared far better uh, than Wall Street fared last year. The local and regional investments effectively, collectively posted positive returns of 6%, which outperformed the actuarial hurdle rate of 4.5%. The NIS entered 2021 and 2022 as a matured, generously designed, and low finance plan in need of urgent reform. Social security isn't static. Its many working parts are designed to change over time. The situation was confirmed by the 11th actuarial report of the National Insurance Fund which stated that the fund is not sustainable in the medium and long term if there are no changes to the benefit provisions and contribution rates. Unfortunately, the multi-pronged challenges of 2021 and the harsh global economic headwinds of 2022 prevented any further parametric changes uh, to the plan in 2021 and 2022. Complicating matters further, the same economic environment that forced a delay in reforms also compounded financial and actuarial challenges for the fund, making the need for reform all the more urgent. Against this backdrop, I don't know, Madam Speaker, I, my understanding is that this is a speech and that they are not debates at this point, but I'd be happy to provide the information yes. later. Yes, it's, it's, it's really an uninterrupted speech that this permission, but it can be clarified a little later. Please continue, Minister. As I go forward, Madam Speaker, I'll, I'll talk about the 11th Actual Report and the entity that conducted the the actuarial study. Um, I lost my place. <laughs> Against this backdrop, and in line with a commitment made in the 2022 budget, the NIS began its social dialogue and stakeholder consultation on the issue of pension reform. This consultation process has been inclusive open and transparent. The government and the NIS are seeking the widest possible stakeholder buy-in and support to place the NIS on more sustainable financial and actuarial footings, whilst ensuring dignified benefits are paid to beneficiaries. Accordingly, the board and management of the NIS engage the key stakeholders in conversations around the NIS's current financial performance the NIS's financial outlook, the factors shaping the NIS's cost trajectory, and possible measures to reform the NIS. To date, the NIS has directly engaged with over 500 constituents through direct consultations with the following groups. <clears throat> Government cabinet members, the heads of labor unions and associations, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce, members of the Public Service Union, the Police Welfare Association, the SVG Nurses Association, and the SVG Teachers Union, media houses, uh, employees from various organizations, uh, church groups, um, and workers at other specific entities. Additionally, public interviews were held on local radio stations and Outreach was done also via the Agency for Public Information. The NIS will intensify and broaden its consultation in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, the first one being, and I'll do a little promotion for the NIS here in the middle of the speech, Madam Speaker, is a consultation with pensioners that is scheduled for the 27th of January at 10 a.m. in the NIS conference room. And, and all pensioners are encouraged uh, to attend, although all the pensioners can't hold in the conference room. Um, <clears throat> the NIS is engaging stakeholders transparently on possible reform options. These options are to guide policymakers on measures to ensure an affordable and adequate social protection system that reflects our value system, 
responds to changing socioeconomic conditions, and satisfies the needs of customers. The reform options to the NIS program are being outlined to interest groups as follows. Improving financial sustainability, which could mean the, the suite of options are increasing the contribution rate, increasing the wage ceiling from $4,300 per month, reducing the maximum percentage for age pension from 60%, reducing the annual pension entitlement from 2% for each year of service for the first 15 years and 1% per year um, of service each year thereafter, increasing the period for reference wages used to compute pensions from the best five years, increasing the early retirement reduction factor from 6%, accelerating the time uh, by, within which the normal pensionable age is 65 years from 2028 when it's now scheduled uh, to an earlier year. Additionally, the suggested uh, reforms to consider regarding enhancing coverage to vulnerable workers, which would introduce coverage for self-employed workers. Sorry, introducing mandatory, co mandatory coverage for self-employed workers, bolstering the adequacy of benefits by increasing minimum pensions, increasing pensions in pay by some percentage points below inflation and introducing unemployment insurance coverage. The, Madam Speaker, external actuary, Life Works Bahamas, submitted the actuarial assessment findings and recommendations for pension reform to the government. Additionally, the NIS is compiling the public's ideas, opinions, and thoughts through their consultations to complement the reform package to be submitted to the cabinet for consideration. Complementing the administrative functions relating to reforming the fund, the NIS plans to embark on other operational and strategic initiatives around improving financial sustainability, coverage, adequacy, corporate governance, and administrative efficiency. The programmatic activities include but are not limited to strengthening revenue mobilization measures for the collection of contributions and arrears, including through judicial processes, extending social security coverage to inf the informal sector and self-employed workers who remain vulnerable due to a lack of proper social protection coverage, fortifying the investment management function to preserve capital and improve financing income, among other things, this would mean converting non-income generating property into income generating property through further investments in, for example, the juicy property and the land at Peter's Hope. And advancement of the digital transformation program to ensure a robust system of social security delivery, cost optimization, and operational efficiency. Notwithstanding, Madam Speaker, the economic and demographic challenges and consequential financial sustainability pressures, the NIS ensured that it maintained its uh, promise of providing income security to individuals and households who had lost their income over, the, over its 36 years of operations. Further, the NIS demonstrated its critical importance to poverty alleviation and social justice in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In addition, the, pan the pandemic further reinforced the indispensable role of the NIS for economic and social stability. Let us all, Madam Speaker, support a system that sustains lives and livelihoods for all Vincentians. That's the NIS pension. Now we talk about the national pension reform. Beyond the NIS pension program, we must simultaneously address public pensions. The reform of the public pension system must comprise amendments and harmonizations 
of two entities, the National Insurance Service, which is the contributory, partly funded, and earnings-related benefit program, and the public sector pension system, which is the, the government pension, the non-contributory pay-as-you-go system, which is funded by the Consolidated Fund, and earnings-related defined program for civil servants. Individually, the systems are adjudged to be generous by design. For example, the NIS has a front-loaded benefit arrangement, a maximum replacement rate of 60%, and a low contribution rate of 10%, one of the lowest in our region, where the average is approaching 13%. In the case of the public sector pension system, uh, the maximum pension is 67%, and the program is non-contributory. The pensions are wholly funded by the government through the consolidated fund. Collectively, both systems run parallel. There is no integration between the designs of the NIS system and the public system. As a result, for civil servants who are covered under both the public sector pension system and the NIS, can potentially receive the maximum combined replacement rate of 127% of their salary. It is simply not sustainable to pay someone more money in retirement than they made while they were working. This is inclusive of an overly generous and unsustainable public pension system based on the regional and international standards. Recognizing the unsus unsustainable nature of the public pension system due to its generous design of high payout and low contribution, the government is considering a number of reform opportunities to harmonize the NIS and the public sector system, the public pension system. Among the options for discussion, and for serious discussion, include closing the public service, the public sector pension system to new entrants, reducing the accrual rate of the PSPS from 1.6% to 1%, introducing a mandatory contribution rate for employees as a percentage of salary, aligning the retirement age of civil servants with the NIS retirement age, and limiting or limiting the maximum replacement rate from 127% to about 85% by considering a top-up mechanism on the NIS pensions. For instance, if the NIS pays 60%, the government could then top up that 60% to reach 80% or so um, for, retirement, for retirees under the PSPS. This is in line with best practices and is similar in design uh, to the private sector employers like those at Korea's and uh, First Caribbean International Bank, which use this top-up mechanism. In the upcoming months, the government intends to deepen and intensify its effort to consult and to embark on these important reform activities. Accordingly, the government will establish a pension reform committee to lead the public consultations technical and legal analysis, and implementation programs to reform the public sector pension system. This year, we intend to settle on the package of necessary reforms and to implement them in the interest of the sustainability of our vital pension system. Madam Speaker. turn to an issue that is critical to all of the developmental challenges and opportunities that we discuss, that of implementation. Another year, 
another record set for capital expenditure in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. While the numbers for 2022 are not yet finalized, we already know that capital expenditure last year exceeded $250 million. For the fourth consecutive year, this represents a record for capital expenditure in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As recently as 2019, we were celebrating $150 million in capital expenditure. Today, we have topped $250 million. These consistently improving levels of expenditure are due in no small part to the focus work of the government on optimizing implementation processes at all stages of the project cycle. We are getting work done, yeah. but there is more work to do. Within the context of our small island reality, history and capacity, Budget 2023 is unprecedented in its scope and staggering in its ambition. The first draft of this budget submitted to the cabinet contained $660 million of capital projects that we worked hard to reduce to its final $472 million that we are considering today. The primary consideration in our selection processes, in addition to the availability of resources were the shovel readiness of the projects for 2023 and the capacity of both the public and private sector to deliver on the ambition of budget 2023. It is worth noting that although the $472 million of capital investment, capital expenditure in budget 2023 is $74 million higher than what was approved in 2022, the required local loans have actually decreased by $5 million. This means that the increase in capital expenditure will be funded largely by soft loans already in hand. It is often said that the government doesn't complete its investment programs due to lack of funds. However, other factors, such as bureaucratic and logistical failings and challenges, are far greater impediments to implementation. Take the CDB-funded National Disaster Management Project, for example. Many of these projects have lingered in the pages of successive budgets as veritable zombies, not dead because the money is available, but also demonstrating no actual signs of life. Last year, we took the decision to rip up the implementation arrangements of the NDM and start over with a view to getting the projects shovel ready. Today, we are ready for action. All but one of the NDM projects will be advertised to contractors between now and February 3rd, and they will all begin work in the second quarter of this year. The government is once again investing broadly in human capacity and, and in implementation. Budget 2023 contains $1.2 million in capital expenditure to support implementation management and implementation within the Ministry of Transport and Works. In each of our major projects, from the port to the hospital to the VEEP and digital transformation projects, we are negotiating with lenders to finance increasingly robust project-specific implementation arrangements we are getting important work done. Of course, no implementation program is immune from hiccups and unforeseen events. The temporary parliament in Calico, though very close to completing, completion, was delayed because of supply chain disruptions related to a steel roof frame out of Trinidad and Tobago. The community center Diamond was designed and funded and put out to bid and awarded but, but unfortunately, local business persons who were storing equipment on the government-owned construction site without permission refused to remove the equipment in a timely manner. And planning authorities were similarly tardy in enforcing the removal order. In the time that it took 
to remove the equipment. The tender lapsed, and now the project will have to be put out for bid all over again. Looking forward, we are monitoring the possible impact of four issues on our ability to implement our ambitious capital program. Supply chain and logistical disruptions, the availability of aggregate and asphalt, the availability of skilled labor and contractor capacity. Budget 2023 again allocates $1 million to the purchase of aggregate overseas if it becomes a challenge locally. Already, there is jostling between the construction teams working on the Sandals Holiday Inn and Black Sands Hotels for available aggregate on island, to say nothing of publicly funded projects. Similarly, contractors are beginning to note that some skill sets are more in demand than ever before. Joiners, tilers, plumbers are all commanding premium wages and slowing implementation as they bounce between multiple projects as independent contractors. Contractors too, especially ones who bid on more projects than they can possibly manage simultaneously, sometimes find themselves at the mercy of unreliable equipment that has been taxed too hard in the midst of this construction boom. The government, particularly the minist ministries of works and economic planning, are closely monitoring these issues and seeking to work with partners to head off any potential delays before they occur. We point out again that there are attractive concessions in place for the importation of construction equipment, and we urge contractors to invest in their own capacity. The construction boom is only just beginning. Madam Speaker, in addition to the ambition of the central government and the investments of the private sector, major state-owned enterprises plan to spend over $50 million in capital works in 2023. The, major, the majority of that expenditure will be through VINLEC. VINLEC estimates that it will spend $40 million in 2023, up from $9 million in 2022. VINLEC's increased expenditure is devoted mainly to solar photovoltaic and battery installations, advanced metering infrastructure, and line upgrades in Beckway and St. Vincent. Madam Speaker, we owe the nation a frank assessment of the continued failure of the $88 million construction of secondary village and feeder roads project to come anywhere close to meeting its implementation targets. The project anchored a 2015 government pledge to conduct extensive road work in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and first appeared in our budget in 2016. Even if you discount the COVID and volcano years entirely, the project is woefully behind schedule. It has become apparent that the entity that won the contract to supervise construction of these 47 kilometers of road underbid drastically and is having difficulty reconciling its contractual obligations with its profit motivations. Despite constant prodding at the highest levels, the very highest levels, our partners in this program have missed deadlines, broken promises, promises and ruined relationships with subcontractors. We remain skeptical about the ability of this project as currently managed to deliver on its original goals in 2023. Budget 2023, $7.9 million allocation to the project reflects that skepticism. Remember, this is a project that still has over $70 million left to spend, but we are allocating one-tenth of that amount to a project in its fifth year of existence. While we are committed to work with our partners to speed up implementation within the existing frameworks, we are increasingly convinced that radical correctives will have to take place in 2023 to get this program moving satisfactorily. 
The government's commitment to consistently improving implementation has never been stronger or more focused. Each year, we get more work done than the year before. While we recognize the breadth and ambition of this year's capital budget, we also recognize that we do not have the luxury of being able to pick and choose which challenges to tackle and which to defer to another day. All are urgent. The challenges and indeed the opportunities of this moment must be met head on and with immediacy and determination. As such, we analyze carefully and set goals optimistically, setting the bar high and striving to reach it with fresh hope that we can indeed meet our goals. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister has frequently declared that ours is a country of laws, a government of laws, not of men. It is a declaration whose provenance can be traced to the American founding father John Adams in the 1700s and before him to the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Today, the phrase finds itself at the root of the theory that strong institutions play a decisive role in sustainable development. Our government firmly adheres to the view that inclusive, independent, people-oriented, and functional institutions rooted in strong legal foundations are an essential ingredient of development. It is a philosophy that motivated our desire to reform our constitution in such a way that it devolved powers from the office of the prime minister and into institutions. In spite of the failure of our attempt at constitutional reform, we remain committed to institution building as an often overlooked but undeniably important measure and contributor to development in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It is for that reason that we are proud of the regional institutions developed by our Caribbean civilization and within the organization of Eastern Caribbean states, like our Central Bank and our Supreme Court and indeed our university. And it is for that reason that we continue to invest in institutions and mechanisms that ensure good governance and inclusivity. We are proud, too, that our local institutions and state-owned enterprises continue to grow in strength and stature. We count our Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines among the best-run institutions in the region. So, too, our electricity services company, our water authority, our lottery authority, our financial services authority, and our financial intelligence unit, our central procurement office, and our National Insurance Service, to name a few. During the Honorable Prime Minister's tenure, the Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has gone from an undercapitalized entity in 2001 to a dominant financial institution, both locally and regionally. The functioning of our Financial Intelligence Unit is lauded as a regional best practice, due in no small part to the foundational efforts of our current Attorney General. We have strengthened the laws that govern public procurement as well as the legislative parameters within which the state-owned enterprises operate. We are proud to report that at last check, the balance in our contingencies fund stands at $39.3 million. When year-end receipts are journalized, this balance will approach $45 million. When we established a contingencies fund in 2017, we simultaneously enacted regulations to ensure that money went in automatically and came out only, after, only under the most specific circumstances. Since its creation, we have relied on the contingencies fund to help us respond to the pandemic and the volcanic eruptions to the tune of $27 million. So we have spent $27 million from the Contingencies Fund, but today we have almost $40 million in the Contingencies Fund. The fund is being replenished now to help us confront 
the next inevitable, unfortunately, disaster. We are also proud to report that the Fiscal Responsibility Mechanism has tabled its first report uh, on the government's budgeting practices and fealty to the guidelines within which we pledge to operate. Even though the Fiscal Responsibility Mechanism came into being at a time of pandemic and hurricane, which, per the terms of the framework, allowed for suspension of certain provisions, the mechanism's first report is an important milestone on our journey of good governance. There is much food for thought in the mechanism's quality work, and the government will share the document publicly and, of course, within this honorable house. The next milestone on our journey of good governance shall be a renewed focus this year on tax dodgers, particularly those who have a history of withholding VAT and PAYE. While its collections have improved commendably, the Inland Revenue Department has been more than patient with people, places, and businesses that view tax compliance as somehow optional or discretionary, or who view a demand for payment as somehow a political attack. It is a fundamental tenet of an inclusive institution that all persons be treated equally under its mandate. In 2023, the Inland Revenue Department will recommend that non-compliant VAT and PAYE withholders are prosecuted. We urge that those who have outstanding assessments to reach out and negotiate settlements of, of arrears as expeditiously as possible. Increasingly, good governance and sound decision making depends on accurate collection analysis and application of data. The government is investing heavily in boosting institutional capacity and professionalism of our stat statistical office and is rolling out a series of data gathering exercises that will boost our ability to make informed decisions in the interest of national development. Budget 2023 allocates $4 million this year to our Data for Decision-Making project, which will pay for modern equipment and the commencement of our important housing and population census. The Data for Decision-Making project will also fund a survey of living conditions, an agriculture and fishery census, and multiple labor demand and labor force surveys. These data, which will be collected free of interference and free of influence, will be publicly available and sufficiently timely that they will be able to inform decision making in real time. A government of laws is not a government without flaws. We do not claim perfection. However, we do claim the determination to continue strengthening our institutions and each day to make our good governance better governance. The debt, Madam Speaker. Our response to the triple challenges of the pandemic, the volcanic eruptions, and hurricane forced the government to incur additional debt to cushion the impact of those shocks and respond to the needs of vulnerable and displaced Vincentians. Our debt burden also increased as we took on ambitious infrastructural projects, most notably the $498 million modern cargo port on the western side of Kingston. However, even in the midst of urgent challenges and even with urgent developmental demands, our borrowings have been disciplined, long-term, and low interest. We have also negotiated debt forgiveness with some of our closer bilateral allies. Because of our discipline and activism, our debt burden is sustainable, and barring another natural disaster, we are on target to achieve the regional targets for debt management ahead of the 2035 deadline. As at September 30th, 2022, the, pope, the total public debt amounted to just under $2.2 billion. This is a 4.1% increase over the total debt 
disbursed, the total disbursed outstanding public debt for the comparative period in 2021. The total domestic debt increased by 6.3% to $555 million uh, as at the 30th of September when compared to the domestic debt for the same period in 2021. Similarly, external debt rose by 3.4% <clears throat> to $1.6 billion. The debt is overwhelmingly highly concessional and long-term. Our additional external debt was incurred through borrowings from the Caribbean Development Bank, the CARICOM Development Fund, the World Bank, and the government of Taiwan. All of these borrowings are highly concessionary and highly concessionary in nature with low interest rates, long repayment time frames, and generous grace periods. As such, our debt is manageable, sustainable, and invested in projects that will grow our economy. Independent analysis universally confirms this conclusion. According to the International Monetary Fund, and I quote, despite the authorities' strong efforts to contain fiscal deficits, critical responses to the shocks pushed up public debt to about 89% of GDP at the end of 2021. The financial system has weathered the shocks relatively well so far with adequate capital and liquidity buffers. The debt sustainability, sustainability analysis suggests that public debt is sustainable but remains at high risk of distress should future shocks materialize. Moody's Investor Service, the credit rating business that provides international financial research on government's credit worthiness, concurs with the IMF assessment, stating, I'm quoting Moody's now, Moody's expects debt to increase marginally over the next two to three years due to ongoing construction efforts after, after the volcano and large infrastructure projects underway. However, debt will stabilize around 83% on the next two to three years. As a result of pandemic and natural disaster shocks, fiscal performance deteriorated in 2020-2021 and government debt increased. Despite the increase in debt burden, which weakens the sovereign's fiscal profile, debt remains highly concessional and debt service remains manageable. Debt affordability will remain broadly stable with interest to revenue ratio below 10% in 2022, 2023. Liquidity risks remain broadly constrained due to the continued, the continued access to concessional funding from bilateral official creditors and multilateral development banks, which supports the island's infrastructural development projects and promotes liquidity for debt service payments." Unquote. Budget 2023 continues the path of prudent, disciplined investment in projects that yield developmental benefits. In this speech, it is also important to confirm unequivocally the government's strong political commitment to meet the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union's target of a 60% debt to GDP ratio by 2035, and our similarly strong commitment to be guided by the provisions of our recently adopted fiscal responsibility framework. Our debt is necessary and concessionary, sustainable, and manageable. Our disciplined government is committed to both paying our debts and prudently managing the fiscal process. Resource requirements. Yeah, 
are almost there. Right. A couple things to go. Budget 2023 cuts your taxes. For the first time since 2018, the government is advancing its long-stated objective of gradually reducing the top marginal income tax rate to approximately 25%. When Prime Minister Gonzalez assumed office in 2001, the top marginal rate was 40%. Today, in establishing a ceiling of 28%, income tax rates enter the 20s for the first time in our history as an independent nation. Additionally, Budget 2023 shifts the standard deduction on personal income tax from $20,000 to $22,000, effectively making another $2,000 in earnings tax-free for most workers. We are proud that we have been able to offer this tax relief in this period of fresh hope. This is a significant action that will affect all formerly employed workers. Further, the tax cuts will reduce burdens on businesses. As a labor government, it is our hope that these businesses invest the proceeds of their tax cuts in the well-being and development of their workforce and in the hiring of additional staff. In consultation with the labor movement, it was brought to the government's attention that while we have been adjusting tax rates and tax deductions over the years, we have left tax brackets untouched. As a result, as salaries have risen, the overwhelming majority of workers now fall within the top tax bracket. It's a valid point. The Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning commits to analyzing the issue of tax brackets in 2023 and discussing options with the labor movement and the business community about a rejiggering of our tax brackets because we're approaching essentially, Madam Speaker, a flat tax because everybody is ending up in, in a single tax bracket because we haven't adjusted the brackets. Budget 2023 also invests in property tax re-evaluations. This exercise is supposed to take place every five years, but was last conducted a decade ago. So that is well past due. Notwithstanding the tax cuts, we estimate that revenue from taxes on income and profits will rise by 5.3% this year as the economy continues to recover. Budget 2023 has a total resource requirement of $1.45 billion. This represents an 8.8% increase over the approved figure for budget 2022. The 2023 resource envelope is made up of $771.7 .7 million in current expenditure, amortization and sinking fund contributions of $202.6 million, and capital outlays of $471.6 million. Budget 2023 will be focused, will be financed by current revenue of, of $761.4 million and capital receipts totaling $684.5 million. Relative to 2022, the increases in this year's overall budget are mainly attributed to current expenditure increasing by 6.1%, capital expenditure increasing by 18.6% and current revenue increasing by 12.4%. Sinking fund contributions remain flat and amortization decreases by 1.2%. In summary, the outlays on this side of the budget, including amortization and sinking fund contributions are as follows. Compensation of employees, $373.8 million. Pensions, $60.3 million. Other transfers, $147.6 million. Interest payments and loan charges, $80.2 million. Goods and services, $109.7 million. Current expenditure, 
771.6 million. You add amortization of 180.6 and sinking fund of 22, and you get $974.3 million. On the capital side of the budget, the allocations by financial classification are in your book uh, and include general public services of 26.1 million, public order and safety of 4.1 million, economic affairs of 235.9 million, environmental protection of 70 million, housing and community amenities of 26.7 million, health of 36.8 million, recreation, culture, and religion of 8.8 .8 million, education, 29.5 million, social protection, 33.7 million for a total capital of $471.6 million. The details of the sources of financing for budget 2023, domestic receipts of 100.2 100 million, capital revenue of 1 million, loans of 99.2 million, external receipts of 584 million, 584.3, made up of grants, 68.7, loans, 289.7, other receipts of 225.9 million, for a total of $684.5 million. Taken at a glance, budget 2023 has a current deficit of $10.3 million, and an overall deficit of 412.2 million. The fiscal summary of the budget 2023 is as follows. Current revenue, $761.4 million. Less your capital expenditure, your current expenditure, sorry, of 771.7, with a, leaves with a current deficit of 10.3. Add grants of 68.7 and capital revenue of one, and you get $59.4 million. Less capital expenditure, $471.6 million. You get an overall deficit of 412.2, which will be financed by external loans of 289.7, local loans of 99, other capital receipts of 225.9. Less amortization and sinking fund, which I mentioned previously, are 180 and $22 million, respectively. Madam Speaker, as global inflation rose, fuel prices increased, and the threat of food insecurity stalked vulnerable Vincentians. The government enacted additional subsidies, tax cuts, and initiatives to help cushion the impacts of price increases. Some of these initiatives included a subsidy on fertilizer, which cost the government $1,013,798 in lost revenue. A feed subsidy to livestock farmers that cost an additional $500,000. The targeted love box support between May and September of last year was $1.7 million. The waiver of the customs service charge on fuel imported by Vinlec to help lower your electricity bill was $1.1 million. The reduction of excise tax on gasoline and diesel at the pump cost the government $3.4 million. The elimination of customs service charges on cooking gas cost the government $439,000. The reduction of customs service charge on flour imports between June and November cost $798,000. And the expansion of the VAT exemption on electricity usage from 150 kilowatt hours to 250 kilowatt hours between July and September cost $195,000. The value of all of those subsidies and concessions and tax cuts 
amounted to lost revenue to the government of $9,148,000, an incredibly generous package of subsidies and concessions. Madam Speaker, not to delay the end of this discussion, but it's necessary to once again return to a debate that we had in this honorable house not so long ago, but I suspect a debate that was not well covered in the media. Um, and that is regarding the adjustments to taxes and tariffs for imported automobiles. And I want to discuss it um, and, and try to offer some clarity. One measure pledged in last year's budget is now, in effect, a complete revamp of the tax and tariff architecture on the importation of automobiles. The specific measures were recently debated and passed in this honorable house. However, in light of some ongoing misinformation and misunderstanding, it is useful to revisit the topic today when hopefully a few more people are watching us. I'm not sure how many are watching at this time. Um, the average motor vehicle in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is about 11 years old and has an average total landed cost of about $27,000. Only 3% of the vehicles imported annually are new or less than three years old. In most cases, in most cases, the tax rate for these vehicles ranges between 135% and 165% of the cost insurance and freight. Average for vehicles imported. Stay with me. As pledged in last year's budget speech, the government has responded to public feedback on the level of taxation levied on imported vehicles. After undertaking careful analysis of our autom automobile market and consumer preferences, the taxation regime for motor vehicles has been reviewed with the following three objectives in mind. To incentivize the purchase of newer, more efficient motor vehicles and disincentivize older, less efficient motor vehicles. To reduce the import duty and excise tax on hybrids and electricals, and to restructure the surcharge regime for all motor vehicles. Our regime reform reduces taxes across the board, but with the deepest, the greatest incentives being on newer vehicles and cars with smaller, more efficient engines. The new harmonized commodity description and coding system and common external tariff that took effect on the 1st of January make provisions for hybrids and electricals, which will be further incentivized. The reductions under the reform and various headings are as follows. Madam Speaker, we're going to discuss the reductions in taxes and tariffs first, and then discuss what I believe to be the, the, the source of the misinformation, which is the surtax structure. Because it's easy to understand if a tax is up or down, but it is more complicated to, to process the, the changes to the surtax regime. <clears throat> Tractors. We're talking import duty and excise tax reductions, vehicle by vehicle. Prior to the reform, the excise tax rate for road tractors and semi-trailers was 55%. We have reduced all categories under this heading from 55% to 35% as tractors. Motor vehicles for the transport of 10 or more passengers, including the driver. So this is your vans now. Vehicles under this heading previously attracted an excise 
tax rate of 45%. Under this reform, they are now 35%. Motor cars and other motor cars principally designed for the transport of persons, um, including station wagons and racing cars. This is your general automobile category now. Before the reform, the majority of vehicles were charged excise tax of 45% and an import duty of 35% with the exception being vehicles under 1,000 cc's. We are reducing them in the following manner. If you have an in internal combustion engine, which is your non-hybrid, non-electrical car, vehicles with these engines will see a reduction of 15 to 20% in excise tax and between 5 to 10% on import duty. If the vehicle is under 1,600 cc's of an engine, the import duty is 25% and the excise tax is 25%. And if it's above 1,600 cc's, it will attract import duty and excise tax of 30%. Hybrid and electricals, it's 20%. Motor vehicles for the transport of goods. Because the construction sector is expected to grow uh, this year, we had a previously had a reduction on trucks of five tons and more, reducing the duty from 60% to 30%. Now we are adding smaller trucks, trucks from 3.5 tons and up and you're giving it the same rate as the bigger trucks. That is all easy. The tax and the surcharge go down across the board. Where the discussion lay is in the surcharge regime. And across the board reduction in import duties and excise taxes is easy to understand. If we, if we stop there, there would be few complaints and fewer misunderstandings. However, if we stop there, our primary objective of incentivizing the purchase of newer, more efficient vehicles would not be met. As such, we have introduced innovations to the surcharge regime to further encourage and promote more efficient and newer vehicles. The present surcharge regime makes use of two factors, age and engine size. The revised surcharge regime makes use of four factors. The factors are as follows. A base surtax, the age factor, the engine size, and the CIF. And the total surcharge is the product of the base surcharge by the age factor, by the engine size, by the, C the CIF factor. There are slight variations for hybrids and buses that don't need to detain us in this particular presentation. There has been some, Madam Speaker, public comment that seems to misconstrue the nature and intent of the reforms. Essentially, those comments can be summarized as if I bought a 12-year-old SUV under the old regime, it would cost more than if I bought the same thing under the revised. It would cost more if I bought it under the revised regime. So if I bought the car last year, I would have paid X, but I buy the 12-year-old car this year and I paid more. So the thing gone up. The short response to that comment is that you get more vehicle for your dollar under this revised system. You should not buy the 12-year-old vehicle. You should buy an 8-year-old vehicle. The 8-year-old vehicle will cost you more at the point of purchase at the Japanese website, but will cost you far less at the port when you bring it in. So you will end up paying less for the 8-year-old vehicle total 
than if you brought in a 12-year-old vehicle. It is a fact that most motor cars, most motor cars nine years or older will be more costly. But that is the point. We would prefer if you buy a newer, more efficient vehicle. In the past, people bought 12-year-old cars because 12-year-old cars were the most affordable to bring into St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Now, the new sweet spot for affordability in normal motor cars will be eight years old. For trucks, coaches, and buses, the sweet spot is 10 years old. Previously, vehicle costs less to purchase overseas and more to clear at the port. That's how it worked in the past. We have since reversed this by reducing the duties on the newer vehicles. Now, vehicles will cost you a little more to purchase overseas, but cost significantly less to clear when you bring it to customs. In short, all things being equal, the amount of money that you spend to buy, ship, and clear a 12-year-old vehicle will get you an 8-year-old vehicle of the same model, of the same car under the new regime. It is important to note that rates we have implemented are among the lowest within CARICOM. Barbados still utilizes excise tax rates as high as 45%, while Jamaica has import duties at 20%. Barbados passed laws that require used motor vehicles to be less than four years old and have an odometer reading of less than 50,000 kilometers in order to qualify for an import license. In Grenada, used cars one to four years old attract duties of 127%, and vehicles older than five years old around 158%. The government, through its reform, has been able to match and in most cases surpass the rates offered throughout the region. Taxes on new combustion vehicles are under 100%, and hybrids and electricals will fall below 69% as a percentage of CIF. On average, most motor cars eight years or under will be in the region of 100% of your CIF, all things being equal. The same thing will hold true for trucks, coaches, and buses under 10 years old. So your sweet spot has moved from 12. Stop trying to buy a 12-year-old car. Look at the prices of the 8-year-old car, and you will see that when you bring it to the port, you end up spending less money than if you had bought the 12-year-old car. <laughs> Our hardworking customs department has placed an intuitive calculator online that allows consumers to play with various scenarios to understand fully what they will pay at the port for different automobiles. We encourage all consumers to plug in their automobile data before they click buy and to see precisely how much money they will spend in different scenarios, different ages, different models, different prices. The website is, and I apologize, Madam Speaker, for this website, and I, I tell you that I will give it, um, I'll organize it to have a catchier um, web address, because you're going to have to write this down. It's not something like cars.com. <laughs> the website address is related to the Asicuda system, the Asicuda world system. So it's Asicuda W, that's A-S-Y-C-U-D-A-W dot S-V-G-Customs dot net slash S-V-G 
dash duty dash calc c a l c dot p h p and we'll put this link on the gov dot the, the government website and we'll also give you a website address that is easier to memorize but it's asicuda w dot s v g customs dot net slash s v g duty calc dot p h p one final issue merits clarification it takes a while for cars ordered from Asia to arrive in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Many consumers, many consumers' 12-year-old cars were already en route to Port Kingston when we revised the tax and tariff regime. Those older vehicles would be disadvantaged under the revised regime. As such, vehicles with documentation indicating that they were purchased before November 15th will be assessed under the old regime. However, any discovery of attempts to falsify documents in an effort to cherry pick different regimes for different vehicles will be addressed using all of the legal tools at the discretion of the Customs Department. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Speaker, to summarize the fiscal measures and discuss other fiscal measures. In Budget 2023, several new fiscal measures will be introduced aimed at modestly increasing the revenue and take-home pay of workers. And we have discussed, Madam Speaker, the, some of these already. Since budget year 2019, no new fiscal measures have been introduced. The implementation of the measures approved and announced for budget 2020 were deferred with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and further deferred due to the volcanic eruptions of 2021. The fiscal measures for budget 2023 will focus on the reduction of income taxes for both individuals and corporations, increases in user fees for some services to maintain some level of parity with the cost of delivering these services and the airport service charge. We have discussed, Madam Speaker, the issue of the reduction of taxes from 30% to 28% and the increase of the threshold from 20 to 22,000. Madam Speaker, on the 12th of June, 2022, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the airport service charge was reduced by 50% from $100 to $50. This measure, which was authorized by statutory rule and order number 22 of 2022, was undertaken as a symbolic means to encourage regional travel. With the collapse of LIAT, travel within the region is proving to be quite challenging. The existing airlift capacity on various inter-island routes is deficient, leading to great inconvenience to the traveling public. Additionally, as travel restrictions internationally and regionally have been rolled back and persons are traveling more freely, although I see the United States has reimposed the visa requirement, the, not visa, sorry, vaccine requirement, um, to enter the U.S. We believe that it is propitious to return the airport service charge to $100. To this end, with effect from May 1st, 2023, the airport service charge will revert to $100 or $40. US An additional $4 million in revenue is expected from this measure. These funds will flow directly to the Argyle International Airport to bolster the operation, the operating bottom line of the company. The overstayers fee under the Immigration Restriction Act is currently $25 if you overstay. In budget 2020, this fee was increased to $100 but was not implemented along with the estimates, along with the extension of stay fees, which was increased to $100. As a result, most persons who wish to stay longer in the country 
simply pay the lower overstay fee than they do to apply for an extension of stay. Because one is $25 and one is $100. Uh, to address this act of arbitrage, the overstay's fee will be increased to $100 with effect from the 1st of February 2023. This measure is expected to yield $100,000 in additional revenue. The revenue measures for which implementation was deferred in the 2020 budget were maritime administration fees, hospital fees, radiological fees, laboratory fees, dental fees, fees for agricultural services, and fisheries division fees. From that list of deferred measures, the following will be implemented in budget 2023, with effect from the 1st of February. The maritime administration fees, the fees for agricultural services, and the fisheries division fees. And the details of these fees are attached as appendices to the speech. The health-related fees will be further deferred uh, pending the completion of the comprehensive review of user fees that is being undertaken as a part of the health sector resilience project. And as such, Madam Speaker, the, when honorable members receive their copies of the speech, they will see the maritime, agricultural, and fisheries division fees, which essentially just pay for the cost of the service that is being provided in those respects. In conclusion. And it's a short conclusion, Madam Speaker. The road from recovery to prosperity can be long and serpentine. The paths of progress are littered with obstacles, setbacks, and diversions. Yet we emerge from a period of extraordinary trials, turmoil, and tumult, eager to trod this road. The volcanic dust has settled, and COVID has receded from a clear and urgent danger to an ever-present cause for concern and caution. The impacts of the war in Ukraine, the resulting sanctions, and the unscrupulous profiteering that accompanies conflict remain with us, like COVID, as an encumbrance but not a barrier to our onward journey. Martin Luther King once famously said that we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. In that spirit, we are fortified in the knowledge that the recent challenges that weighed us down in the past can never extinguish fresh hope for a stronger St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The book of Isaiah says, and it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstacle out of the way of my people. Budget 2023 is a building up budget. It is a blueprint for building up roads, building up resilience, and building up for the future. It cuts taxes, it raises salaries, and it invests like never before in our country's history in the types of projects and positions us for strong development for years to come. We have emerged from the recent trials battered but unbowed. As we make this next step on the road from recovery to resilience and beyond, we do so with the knowledge that what doesn't kill us only makes us stronger. And with fresh hope in the huge potential of our small country. We will not be weakened by cynicism or slowed by lamentations. Instead, starting with budget 2023, we will rise to meet the moment and seize the many opportunities that stretch out before us. 
We are a highly skilled people with a boundless entrepreneurial drive and an indomitable spirit. This is a budget for that moment, for this nation, and for the transformation of our great country. I'm obliged, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I may, be, before we conclude for the day, honorable members have received, I've noted, the, a printed copy of the budget speech. As I read it, I noted one or two errors in the text, as, as has happened in the past. And while they are not significant errors, I will endeavor over the course of this week to get you a, a tidied up copy. Um, but you may see one or two typographical errors uh, in the copy that you have, but I don't believe that they will alter in any way your appreciation uh, of or your ability to debate the, the, the speech. Thank you. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, tomorrow we return at nine. Yes. Accordingly, I beg to move that this honorable house do stand suspended mm -hmm. until tomorrow, Tuesday, the 10th of January at 9 a.m. Honorable members, the question is that this, that this house do stand suspended until tomorrow, 10th January, 2023, at 9 a.m. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The eyes have it, house stands suspended.